Okay, we're down to the last hour and we have to finish by 12.15 because apparently we're going to have some pictures taken. So, line positions, line strengths, line shapes. So, when do we care about line shapes? Well, we, we care about line shapes if we're doing spectrally resolved absorption or emission. So, there are times when we care. Uh, because a common measurement technique is to use a monochromatic laser and measure the attenuation of light at that single frequency. So that depends on the number density of absorbers, the line strength, and the line shape function. If the laser is spectrally broad, broader than the absorption line, you have a different problem. Beer's law doesn't actually apply. So remember, Beer's law is for monochromatic light. If you do an experiment in which you tune the absorbing the laser across the absorption line, you can integrate out the shape effects and you'll get the total number density directly. But uh, if you're looking at fixed frequency and trying to interpret your attenuation, then you need the line shape. If you're using a pulse laser that has spectral width, you just have to be very careful because the laser has line width and the gas has line width and you have to do the convolution. If you're interested in using laser-induced fluorescence, you have to recognize that fluorescence is absorption followed by emission. So then you ask the question, do I have a monochromatic laser? What is, what's the role of the line shape function? So line shape function does come into play, but it's not always a critical thing. If you're doing emission, if you're measuring emission from, uh, from, a, from a combustion gas and you're doing spectrally resolved light, spectrally resolved maybe using a spectrometer, you may only be able to capture the integrated light from a line. Again, then you, you don't, you can't observe the line shape function, but you don't care because the integrated light, is conservation of energy, you do, you do see it. So there are times when you can get around the need to know the line shape function, but there are also times when you need to know it. And uh, I became interested in this because as lasers became available to scan the shape of a line, and it depends upon temperature and pressure, I realized that this is a way to measure temperature and pressure. It was only enabled by the fact we had monochromatic, tunable monochromatic sources. And furthermore, if you have a laser that can be tuned and you park it at the center of a line, if the light gas is moving relative to your uh, direction of the light beam, you can observe a Doppler effect. And so you can also measure velocity. So there's some advantages to being able to, uh, to, take, it, to take advantage of the line shape information if you have, a, if you have uh, the right kind of uh, experiment. Okay, so we're gonna zip through um, this in one lecture. Uh, we'll talk about the types of broadening and how we usually combine those into a Voigt profile. And I'll give you some examples of how we can use this line shape information and some working examples. So, and I want to do this in 50, 55 minutes here. So we have a line which is uh, zero. So remember, this is the, the integral of this is one. It's defined. Uh, phi uh, nu zero is the line center value. This is the full width at half the maximum value right here. So you go to half the peak height and measure the full width, and that would be the full width at half maximum. So it goes to zero in the wings. That means if you have light out here, there's no absorption or emission, only in this region. So back to my problem here. Mm -hmm. Oops, well, it went to two, okay. Um, so here's our Beer's Law again. Uh, repeating this, e to the minus k nu l, where the line shape function comes in here. So k is the combination of line strength and line uh, shape. Now we can use, again, different units. We can use b's or we can use a's. Doesn't make any difference. We can find the relationship between this fundamental line strength and uh, h constants, number density of in the absorbing state coefficient from B into two. So this is a specific transition and a specific transition that we're working with here. I always like to work with A because units of A are seconds of minus one. Units of B, there are different units that are in play. So it's just safer if you work in terms of A, simple units. And there's all these alternate forms. You have to go back and forth between uh, Hertz units of frequency, uh, inverse seconds or inverse uh, centimeters or wave numbers, so, but the, multiple, the conversion is just C. So you have to decide what your units are because remember the units of, of uh, phi are inverse with the units of the frequency that you're using. So we can go back and forth between these two systems. Um, 
Perhaps this is the most common form where the units of s are just centimeters to the minus two. K is always centimeters to the minus one. So it's just a question of deciding what combination you're going to use here. So you have seconds, you have seconds, or you have centimeters here. In the infrared, we like to use these units. I, I guess this is because this is the way I learned it. So we use centimeters to minus two per atmosphere. So that's the same as centimeters to minus two divided by the partial pressure of I in atmospheres. And so if you invoke um, P equals NKT, you can do the conversion yourself. So just be very, very careful about units. Um, and you have to be careful about the, the units also of pressure. So the conversion between uh, atmospheres and dynes per square centimeter is 10 to the sixth. So it's basically using P equals NKT and the relationship of uh, pressure in dynes per square centimeter per atmosphere. And that, those units uh, frequently surface. Okay, so this is a reminder that high trend tends to use these units, uh, whereas a lot of uh, d d data are uh, in this units. So you have to be able to go back and forth. Okay, so how do we obtain these numbers? Some people were asking questions about this. This is pretty good. So the way we would do it now is we would scan a laser across an individual absorption line. So we might have a static cell. Uh, it might be a room temperature static cell. It might be a high temperature static cell. Uh, it would be of known length, known pressure, known temperature, and we would put in either a pure gas or we might measure a, a mixture. And we would scan the uh, laser across the individual absorption line, convert that through Beer's law to the absorption coefficient K, now we have k. So we measure transmission as a function of frequency, take the logarithm, negative logarithm, plot it as k. The area is the line strength. We're done. Now that's the line strength for that sample. So we have to be a little careful. Uh, what does that relate to? So we have to, if we're interested in the line shape, we take this number and we, and we plot it now as, as the local k divided by the integral. So now we have a normalized line shape function and we can use that to interpret the types of broadening that we have present. If this area, however, depends upon the number density. So if you wanted to get back to the Einstein coefficient, you would have to make use of the known value of L and the known value of the number density in that state to get to the Einstein coefficient. But right now we're talking about line shape. So we would, we would convert the data to this form and study this shape and try to interpret it in terms of the different models. There's a few of the most common types of broadening. One is called natural broadening. Another one is called collision or pressure broadening. And these all have to do with the fact that the molecule will spend a finite amount of time in a given state before it undergoes change. So either because it undergoes a collision or because it undergoes spontaneous emission up here, there will be a finite time. And that finite time uh, comes into play through the um, uh, uncertainty principle, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So both of these have to do with time. How long does the molecule or atom spend in a state? And when it's lifetime limited like this, that's called homogeneous broadening because it affects all the molecules uh, under uh, equally, equally. But there's another type of broadening that's pretty important, and that's the Doppler broadening. So that's the result of the thermal motion. So because all of the molecules, the molecules are moving at different speeds relative to the direction of interrogation, they're all moving at different speeds given by the Maxwell, Maxwell distribution. Maxwell distribution. That means that the individual molecules do not have the same absorption property, and that would then be called. Uh, inhomogeneous or heterogeneous broadening. So there's really two classes. This class of homogeneous, affects all molecules the same, leads in time limited, leads to a Lorentzian shape for the line. Whereas this class, here we go again, leads to a, a different uh, mathematical form. And it's because those two mathematical limits, I'll work on this tonight. Because of those two different mathematical limits, we end up with uh, the need to combine these two, and that leads to what's called the Voigt function. If they were of the same form, this, if they were both Lorentzian or if they're both Gaussian, we could add them up. But because they're of different mathematical forms, we have a bit of a problem. There we go again. Uh, 
the VoIP protocol is the first level uh, combination of the two. There are advanced forms of this, but the VoIP profile is based upon certain assumptions, approximations really, and we, uh, that combine these two types of uh, form. That's called uh, Lorentzian plus Gaussian convolution. Okay, so the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that if you constrain uh, time uh, uh, tightly, then you must necessarily uh, unconstrain energy. So there becomes a fuzziness in the energy specification that relates to the uh, specification of time. So what controls time? Well, the time between collisions, that's the lifetime it spends in a given state. Uh, that would be the time actually in an inelastic collision. Remember, there are elastic collisions and inelastic collisions. Only the inelastic ones change the quantum state. So if we invoke this, we can find right away that there's some uncertainty in frequency or width. This goes one over two pi times the time. So if, there, if it was a radiative process, we would put the average lifetime here. And that would be called, and that's the uh, basis of what's called natural line broadening, in contrast with collision broadening. Most of the time, the natural contribution is small, but it has the same mathematical formalism as the uh, collision. So we go through the uncertainty principle here again. So in general, the, uh, the combination, you have to consider both the upper state and the lower state. So there's some fuzziness in the upper state and some fuzziness in the lower state that may apply. If, this is the, if the lower state is the ground state from which there's no further opportunity for radiative emission, then that one is, uh, goes away. But, so it depends on whether you're connecting two excited states or an excited state and a ground state. So natural broadening due to radiative decay, radiative lifetime. Some typical values. If we had an electronic transition for that lifetime was about um, 10 to the minus 8 seconds, that would be 10 nanoseconds. So if you have a, an atom like sodium and you put it in an excited state, the like sodium example I did, it will decay in maybe 10 nanoseconds. So this is realistic for a, an atom. Uh, that would correspond to a width of uh, 10 to the 7th, or if we want to do this in terms of wave numbers, about 10 to the minus 4. If, on the other hand, we look at a um, vibration, row vibrational spectrum, where I just showed you a minute ago that the average lifetime for uh, CO was uh, 28 milliseconds or something like that. If you put in a number that's, uh, that's small like that, you find out that the natural line width is negligible. So that's the basis of my statement that usually we can neglect natural line broadening. Usually they're much smaller than the Doppler width and the collision broadened line width that we're going to deal with in combustion problems, which are usually at uh, half, uh, half an atmosphere up to maybe tens of atmospheres. Now, so there's the um, natural line broadening, and then we're going to get to the... Um, we're going to get to the collision broadening in a minute. Now, the other form, uh, so the form of this uh, can be shown to be um, um, Lorentzian, so that the line shape function is uh, given by the full width at half maximum divided by 2 and then the square of the distance from line center. So this is the so-called Lorentzian because of this nu minus nu zero form here, 1 over nu minus nu zero squared term plus this constant. So that's the Lorentzian form of this result. And so if you look at this and ask, well, what's the maximum value of this quantity? It would be 1 over the full width at half maximum. So it's 2 over pi, 1 over the... So basically, that's how it scales. Now, you can actually derive this, and it's done in the book by Demptroder, in terms of a damped oscillator. And so you can actually do the mathematical uh, solution to a damped oscillator. And, and uh, let's see if this shows up. I had to fix this recently. Oh, it did show up. OK. So the solution, which you can find in a book like this from Demptroder, is that these are the oscillations uh, as this oscillator damps. So it's a kind of a classic model. They do a classic model of, a, of an electron that's oscillating and it's damped and over the lifetime of the uh, process. Anyway, that's the basis of deriving this um, Lorentzian form. 
looks like you're not going to be able to get that back. So anyway, this is the mathematical way of showing that it's Lorentzian. And depending on the, the damping rate, which is the related to the, uh, the decay rate. So there is a mathematical justification for the Lorentzian form. OK. So look, this was a lifetime broadening based upon the radiative decay rate. Much more important for us usually is the collisional rate, because the collisions that are inelastic cause the molecule to change quantum state. So it's no longer in the same state. And the question is, how often does that happen? And so we invoke what's called a simple kinetic, kinetic uh, theory hard sphere model in which we imagine um, uh, a molecule B um, moving past a molecule A or a molecule A moving past B. And so the extrema over which you can call this a collision is called the optical collision diameter. So if you took kinetic theory, and so how many people have had an entry-level course in kinetic theory? Yeah, so you would have seen the hard sphere collision frequency, which you can use to derive um, transport properties, for example. Mu is 1 over pi d squared n. So you use that same kind of hard sphere thinking. Are molecules hard spheres? No. But it's good enough to get at a, at, at a model result. So this result will allow you to, to um, solve for the line shape that would apply for a certain collision frequency. And the collision frequency is going to depend upon the speeds and the sizes of the, uh, of the partners. This is called an optical cross-section. So in fact, you can, you can define a, a hard sphere cross-section for viscosity. And you can define one for heat conductivity. So they're all slightly different. It's, an, it's a model that relates the, uh, um, the, the parent size of the molecule to, to a cross-section. This is therefore, to be specific, called the optical cross-section. But in the simple model, which most of you probably will have seen, the number of collisions of, per second of a single B moving through sp space at velocity V. So if an A is here, that's a collision. Or if an A is anywhere in this direction, it's a collision. It's ditto. So we can get at this, uh, the number of collisions of a single B with all A. So why do we care? It's the collision rate of a single B that determines the lifetime of a single B in that quantum state. So if that's the, care, the number that we care about. That's going to depend upon the number of A's. If there's no A's, there's no collisions. So it's the optical cross-section times the mean molecular speed of that B molecule colliding with A's. So there's the reduced mass. So obviously, it's going to be dependent on the number density of A's, which we could have written in terms of the partial pressure of A's, as the partial pressure here would be the total static pressure and the partial pressure of A. So we're going to sum this over all of the A's, because there, there may be many A's, candidate A's. Depends on the speed and the temperature. And we sum this up. And hopefully, the next slide will show me the answer. So the collision rate, number of collisions per second of a single B can be written this way in terms of a summation over all the collision partners A, because there may be more than one collision partner. And it depends on the square root of t. And if we, if we consider this to be a constant and independent of temperature and velocity, we can get a pretty simple result. So you have to remember that the half width is the 1 over 2 pi times the sum of the inverses of the upper and the lower states. So if you say that the collision rate is the same for the upper and the lower, we get a 2 here, and the, the 2 goes away. So basically, this half width in second, inverse second units is zb over pi, basically 1 over pi times the collision frequency. If I want to write this now in terms of pressure and atmospheres and mole fractions and cross sections, which I can do, I finally end up with the expression that most people use. So this is the collision width in uh, inverse seconds or hertz. Oh, there we go. I thought I had this fixed a day ago. You can get yourself to this expression, which is the most common expression, that the full width at half maximum due to collisions is that pressure times the summation over the collision partners A of their mole fractions times the broadening coefficient 2 gamma of A. Now, some people use gamma 
some people, I use two gamma. Two gamma reminds me that I've used the full width at half maximum. So you always have to be careful. Are people talking about the half width or the full width? So two gamma reminds me that the two gamma is the full width at half maximum. Factor of two rolling around sometimes. I want to go back and forth between these units. There's just a value of C. So this is what happens. What will be tabulated in the literature, if you can find it, is the collisional broadening coefficient when B collides with this species A at this temperature. The pressure is just the scaling factor that tells me about the frequency. This two gamma depends upon temperature. So you have to find, if you want to make calculations, you have to find this two gamma as a function of temperature for B colliding with A. And you have to sum over all the A species. We still have the Lorentzian form because it's lifetime limited. So now it's just a question of using the full width at half maximum, full width at half maximum uh, divided by two, that's a half width in the Lorentzian form. So lifetime limited broadening, Lorentzian. Velocity or temperature dominated broadening is going to be, did I say that right, is Gaussian. So a crude approximation, this two gamma. If I look up here in the limit that this is independent of t, which is not exactly correct, I pick up the square root of t, and I find that the result should be, for a hard sphere, is the two gamma at any temperature is that at 300 times this ratio. The trouble is this is slightly temperature dependent. And it also even depends upon the quantum state. Because it has to do with how do molecules interact with each other when they have a collision. They're not hard sphere. So typically, these num this number here uh, ranges from 1 half up to about 1. But we found some anomalies which have uh, strange behavior in water. So when the molecules are polar, you can find some anomalies where the hard sphere model begins to break down. And we have to measure these broadening coefficients. OK, so this is how we go about this. These are the results for carbon monoxide. And we looked at a specific line. So now you would know that that's the, you know now what this means. We're looking at the second overtone of CO. That means we're going from zero, vehicle zero to vehicles two, or excuse me, the vehicle three. And we're doing the R09 line. So we're looking at an R branch transition that originates from J of nine. And we're doing this in air. So we take the population of air, and we, and we insert the broadening coefficients, which we've, we've measured. And we take these mole fractions, and we solve for the answer. So it's the mole fraction weighted collision broadening number. And it's much bigger than the natural broadening. So this is usually the dominant term that we have to keep track of. What did I do? I did this at 300. Let's see if we go back here. So we did this now at um, 300 degrees. Let's compare what happens if we do this at um, 300 degrees for some other species, and then if we go to high temperature. So here's some numbers. And some of these were from our laboratory. Some were taken from the literature. This shows you if you had sodium in the resonance transition at 590 nanometers, the broadening differs between nitrogen and argon. Here's potassium. Same argon is bigger than nitrogen. Rubidium is an interesting one, really big number. On the other hand, we go to OH, and look how small this number is. So they are um, species dependent. Rule of thumb for a lot of, uh, if you look in the infrared transitions, that would be here, here, and here. Because these, see these wavelengths. If you look in the infrared, they tend to be around 0.1. So if in, when in doubt, you assume 0.1 for the infrared. It's not bad. If we go into the UV, for example, now if we go to NO in the ultraviolet range 225, um, they tend to be smaller numbers, but quite a bit bigger than the numbers for OH. NO is kind of a polar molecule. Whenever you have that, you get bigger numbers. Just like for water, you get bigger numbers. OK, so collision broadening is lifetime broadening, the uncertainty principle, Lorentzian, 
is usually expressed in terms of a broadening coefficient to gamma, which varies with t. If you go to HITRAN, um, you, you can find the number at room temperature, but the extension to higher temperatures is pretty weak, pretty poorly known. Usually they only give you the broadening with air, but we care about combustion gases. Doppler broadening, basically the Doppler principle that says the apparent frequency that would be observed would be the actual frequency of the light source modified by the velocity of the, of the uh, collider, of the, of the moving molecule relative to C. So if you're moving towards the light beam, you see a higher frequency. If you're moving away from the light beam, you see a lower frequency. What does that do? Well, because we know the Maxwellian distribution function, we really know how to calculate this exactly. And when that calculation is done, you get this form right here. This is the Gaussian part, so it's e to the minus delta nu squared. And you can evaluate the full width at half maximum, and it's the square root of t. So that tells us, and this is the one I remember. Delta nu d is, because there's a bunch of sevens here. Seven, one, seven, 10 to the minus seven, nu zero t over m. Well, it depends upon the mass of the emitter, so why is that? If you have a light uh, particle, it's moving faster at a given t higher velocities. So the point of this is that the Doppler uh, half width goes to the square root of t. And it came about because of this exponential function leads to this exponential function. Now, the plasma people might want to know about Stark broadening. When you have uh, charged particles, you get, a different, you get different relationships because those different forces come into play to perturb the energy levels. Okay, in many cases, you also have to worry about the instrument you're using causing broadening. If you have a monochromatic source, no problem. But if you have a, a, an instrument that is, is being used to resolve the absorption lines, you will have instrument broadening. There's other problem, so other, another problem is that if you use a really powerful laser, you might distort the populations in a way that causes a change in this line sheet. That's called saturation. There's also something called saturation or time, transit time broadening. If the gas is moving at high speed this way, and, the, and it's being illuminated by a laser beam this way over at length d, the length of time that that gas particle spends there is v over d, or this is the delta, delta one over the time, is v over d. So what that means is if it's moving at really high speed over a small distance, it spends so long, it spends such a short time here, that that's an effective uncertainty in time. And that's called transit time broadening. And that can be used uh, in, in uh, some high-speed flow experiments. Okay, some numerical examples here. So here we have um, uh, 300 degrees Kelvin, uh, one atmosphere, electronic transitions, and we take the Doppler width and we get uh, 10 to the ninth. I said that Doppler width, let's see. Yeah, Doppler width. So I, to get the Doppler width, I need to know the temperature and the mass and the frequency. 7.17 times 10 to the minus 7, nu zero square root of t over m. So that gives me the Doppler width, which converted to wave numbers is 0.04. Now if I go over here to vibration rotation transitions at six microns, where there's some sort of an apparent vibrational frequency of 10 to the 13th, I get a Doppler width that's really, Doppler width that's really small, but you get a collision width that's really big. In this case, the collision widths are actually equal. Of course, this is, a different, this is a different species. So there are different regimes in which the Doppler effect dominates and the uh, collision broadening dominates. Here's another example at high temperatures. High temperatures, the same molecular weight, same pressure, electronic transition. So all of this is the same, but of course, we've changed the temperature. So we've changed the, uh, we've changed the uh, Doppler width. Now here's the, and the collision width. So basically we know how these things scale with temperature. So uh, now in this, in this example here for electronic <coughs> transitions, we find that they're within a factor of three. So when a factor of three, you can't neglect either one. So we run into a lot of situations in combustion where you cannot neglect one of them. If you go far enough out in the infrared, you can usually find a case where the Doppler width is smaller, but not at high temperatures. So it very much depends upon pressure, temperature, and wavelength. Over time, we've learned that that's not a problem. 
to, uh, to combine these two functions. And um, it, a lot of people still want to do this. They want to decide, well, is it Doppler broadened or collision broadened? So that will occur when it's low pressures and high T and small wavelengths. But when we go to large infrared, we always have collision broadening. So if you want to use just one mathematical function, you might be OK. But for the most part, we have to consider both. And we do that with a void profile. So here's the line shape function. Here's the line shape function for a pure Doppler, black one. And now this is a case where we have, uh, so pure Doppler, this is a Voigt profile, but in the limit of, uh, oh, I have to define A for you here. I didn't do this A. The Voigt function depends upon um, the relative sizes of the collision and the Doppler. I must have, did I skip a line here? Oh, I think I've left out a slide, sorry. So the shape of the line changes as you increase the collision broadening from 0 to 1 to 2. The line becomes broader. Uh, I think I've got my slides out of order. Sorry. OK, I give. This is a junction between two lectures, and so it's a little discontinuous. Sorry. So the collision broadening review. Uh, collision broadening is lifetime limited, is Lorentzian. And this is the expression that we use. And we have to get this from the literature, or we have to measure it ourselves. Typical value. So I say, when in doubt, use 0.1. If you're in the limit of uh, the cross section is constant, this is proportional to 1 over t. But that's only an approximation. So when the, in the, if you haven't got any other guidance, use 0.1 in the square root of t. Gaussian, Doppler is Gaussian. This is the relation you remember. Depends on the mass and the temperature. Typical values. Oh, this is a repeat of what I've told you. So there's two types of broadening, homogeneous and inhomogeneous, uh, the, and, and that you have to take into account. And the reason for doing that is that the more advanced theories that combine these two types of broadening take this into account. OK, now we're ready to kind of compare uh, Doppler and collision. So this is a case where we've got the, uh, the line shape function, so the integrated area is 1 for both of them. The Gaussian one falls off faster. The Lorentzian falls off slower. So you see the difference? They both have an area of 1. And they're drawn here for the case where they have the same half width. But look at the relative value. So if you're working at line center, it makes a big difference whether you have got a Gaussian model or a Lorentzian model. If you look at this example for here, where they have the half widths are the same, the, this one is 50% higher. So you do have to take this into account in a lot of problems. Now, someone asked about collision narrowing. So there are some exceptions. It's a low pressure phenomenon. You have to add another parameter. That usually becomes called the Galatri profile. Stark broadening, you have to add another parameter, it's, and that changes the Voigt model. OK, so the argument, and there's an argument for this model. Physical argument for the Voigt profile is that these effects are decoupled. So that you argue, basically, that um, the collision broadening is independent of velocity. Regardless of your velocity, your collision frequency is about the same. That's an approximation. But if you make this approximation, then you can convolve these two types of broadening and integrate over the, the function and you end up with this result. It's an integral. And it's an integral for which there's no uh, closed form solution. So it's usually done in terms of a, oops, it's like a, I think there's something missing here. Uh, OK, the voice function is missing here. So this is, uh, <laughs> we'll see it, hopefully we'll see it. It's, the in, it's this integral, but with a multiplier out front. But in this integral, uh, a is used to denote the ratio of the collision broadening to the Doppler width. So it's basically square root log 2 times the ratio. A. If A is 0, collision broadening is small. If A is small, collision broadening is small. If A is large, collision broadening dominates. W is used to, uh, is the distance from line center normalized by the Doppler width. Hopefully this is going to look better next to my word. Somehow the voice function disappeared. That's unfortunate. 
Okay. Maybe this is to remind me that the void function is tabulated. <laughs> <laughs> there are some approximations in the literature. People, there's a handful of people have tried to find approximate solutions that are closed form. But basically, the void function is the product of, a, of the Doppler shape times the void function V that is tabulated. What, dear, dear. The void function is the ratio of the, of the void line fu shape function to V. So you can see it here. This is the, so you end up with the right answer. Uh, that's unfortunate. There are only a couple of places where <clears throat> this has a, a closed form solution. In the limit that you're at line center, in the limit that you're line center, the void function depends only on A, because remember W is nu minus nu zero. So then you have the exponential and a complementary error function. That's the only condition at which there's a simple closed form solution. So for example, uh, A of one, this number is 0.43. So if the ratio of the line width is about the same, uh, this function uh, is, uh, the void function is 0.4. Oh dear, okay, good. So. Sorry for the fact that the equations are missing. So this is the void table. Remember, W is the distance from line center. A is the ratio of collision broadening to Doppler broadening. So this is the line center value. So when you're at A of small, that means collision broadening. It means you're close to the Doppler limit. Doppler limit would be 1 here. So out here, when broadening is um, equal, you get 0.4. So anyway, we typically resort to these tables. But there are some, some closed form solutions that work in limited ranges. So now how would we use this? So we're given a situation where we'd like to evaluate the void function. What do you need to know? You need to know the temperature and the molecular weight and nu zero because that what goes into delta nu d. You need to know the pressure and either the cross section or two gamma because that's what goes into delta nu c. So you desire the line shape function for void. Procedurally, you compute the delta nu d, for which you need t, m, and nu zero. And then you can therefore get delta, uh, you can get a phi, uh, the Doppler function at, nu, at line center. You want to then get delta nu c. With that in hand, you can get a, which is this ratio. Then you have to pick a value of w, which is how far from line center. So you pick a W and you obtain the ratio and, you're, and you're, you're done. Now you pick another W and you map it out. So we would have this in, a, in a, uh, some uh, analytical forms that we have developed for different ranges and we would do this kind of automatically. We're not using the tables. Okay, there's, there's these limiting cases of collision narrowing. Okay, I've got a student who's been really interested in this and he's done what's called a Berman profile. So if you say the broadening is not, if you go away from the hard sphere model and say the broadening depends upon the speed, you get a speed dependent broadening term, you get a slight correction. So there are some adjustments. Now there's one more, another complication. In addition to broadening, collisions cause a shift in the center of the line. And so that interaction between two partners colliding changes a perturbation in the energy level structure, not just broadening, but it shifts them. And that corresponds to what's called a pressure shift. So you also can evaluate the shift in the center of the line position, linearly proportional to the collision frequency. And so it can be expressed just like we had a two gamma here, now we have a delta. And delta is used to, for the pressure shift. It's a little bit tricky because it turns out that this uh, can be either plus or minus. Um, it's not just a positive number. It can, be, it can shift either way. Then there's the Doppler shift. So if the light beam is coming in and the, and the uh, velocity of the gas is moving this way, the component along this direction is uh, u v cosine theta, and that causes a shift in the apparent line. So that could be a problem or it's an opportunity. If you're doing an experiment where you have to worry about this, uh, you have to take care of it, but it also becomes a way to, uh, to measure velocity, which I'm gonna show you. Okay, yeah. So I guess I'm going to show you how we can take advantage. So I became really interested in line shapes when I got involved with lasers. 
And uh, really, uh, we found lots of advantages of doing this. So remember, if we, do, uh, if we integrate over the absorbance, we get this quantity here. So if we know the length, and we know the pressure, and we know the line strength, which depends upon temperature, we can solve for the species mole fraction. That's the most common experiment. You send light through, you measure the attenuation, you know the pressure, you know the path length, you know the temperature, so you know S, and you solve for, for X. If you don't know the temperature, then you don't know S. So now you have to first measure the temperature by taking the ratio of two lines. So you can measure the relative absorption, get the temperature, and then use either one of them to get the, uh, th that, that specifies S, and either one of them to get the number density. So the most common experiment is to either use this to measure temperature or mole fraction. It's a, it's a line of sight average number. Okay, temperature, you could use the Doppler shape. Uh, at really high temperatures, we do this sometimes. Um, so the, because the half width at really high temperatures, like we do this at uh, 8,000, 9,000 degrees Kelvin, the width of the line is dominated by Doppler broadening. So you can get the temperature that way. The virtue of this is that it's the kinetic temperature. It's the temperature that reflects the, velo the, the velocity of the molecules. That could be different than the temperature in the rotational distributions. So when people ask, well, what if there's not just one temperature? Well, you can get at this temperature. You can get at the kinetic temperature this way. You can get at the rotational temperature by taking the two-line technique. Or you can get the vibrational temperature by taking two lines from different vibrational levels. So there are always tricks to get to the different temperatures if there are multiple temperatures. The best way to get temperature is by looking at the ratio of two lines of the same species. And so if you go back to the equations that we're, I showed you earlier for the line strength at any arbitrary t in terms of the line strength at the reference t, then the ratio of these s's, two different lines, is given by the ratio of the reference numbers times an energy difference and a difference in temperature. This turns out to be the very best way to measure temperature. So you can measure temperature by looking at the relative absorption in two lines uh, this way. So we might get these from HITRAN, the line strength at reference temperature T0 for the two lines. So independent, and then uh, with this expression, everything goes away except this reference tabulation, the measured ratio, the energy difference between the two lines and the temperature, and that gives us the temperature. That's, and this scales with delta E, so you always want to pick lines which have the biggest separation in lower state energy. So you can evaluate the relative sensitivity by looking at the fractional change in this ratio with T and convince yourself that what you always want is the largest energy difference. And so if you do this right, you can get extremely sensitive temperature measurements. Some examples. Am I doing on time? Okay. Uh, let's go back to sodium. Why do I like sodium? Sodium is the simplest atom. One electron, simple spectroscopy. Uh, it's a strong, if you look in a flame, if, if you have a burner in your laboratory and somebody's put their finger across this flame, you will see sodium, light from sodium. Very sense. Small amounts of sodium. If there's any experiment in which you put your, every touch with your hands, there's, there's some sodium or potassium. So it's 590 nanometers, 1600 Kelvin, one atmosphere, and we, wanna, we want to measure um, the partial pressure of uh, sodium. So we measure the... Uh, we measure the fractional transmission, take the logarithm, divide by the length, we get the spectral absorption coefficient that we've observed. We've got to find the line shape function in order to get at the partial pressure. So we look at collision broadening and we put in some approximate numbers and we get 0.21. We look at the Doppler broadening at some uh, temperature, 1600, and we get the, the uh, Doppler term. We put those together to get the Voigt A 1.75, go into the Voigt tables, uh, and you get this, uh, at, at line center, you get 0.28. So that you have to evaluate the Doppler width at line center, that's, that's 9.39. Put all this together, we get the, the, the Voigt function, 2.68. So we're done. We take the measured uh, extinction, divide by S phi, and we got the partial pressure. I wonder if I show an example here. It looks like I didn't show you. Typically, you can measure uh, parts per million. 
I guess I can't show you because I didn't tell you what this number was. I think it's in my reader. Okay, uh, another example. Hydrogen, this is a real example. We did this in laboratory. Atomic age velocity. So we had a student who was interested in uh, electric propulsion and in using an arc jet, which is a heated uh, jet, heated jet of uh, hydrogen, molecular hydrogen. So you put in electrical energy, you heat this up, expand it in a nozzle, and you get thrust. The question is, what's coming out? How fast is this uh, gas stream? So we used absorption of light monitored by fluorescence. Let's see if I've got a sketch here. Oh, here's the experiment. So here's the heated uh, our, uh, hydrogen. Now, the heating is going to cause the hydrogen molecules to become hydrogen atoms. The hydrogen atoms stream out of here, uh, conservation of enthalpy. So you can you take the stagnation enthalpy and convert it to velocity. The question is, how fast is it moving? You want to know how fast it's moving. So bring in, uh, you bring in laser light. Imagine you bring laser light in up the axis of this tunnel. Now we observe the fluorescence at right angles. So fluorescence is emission, is uh, emission following absorption. So this atom absorbs some of this laser light and spontaneously emits at right angles. And so if we scan this laser, I mean, actually I, I, I'm showing you two examples. We did this example with um, hydrogen and the student observed velocities of up to about four or five kilometers per second. So what happens? You see, the point is the, the beam sees a higher frequency. So you find the uh, shift in the frequency by looking at the emission. So if you scan this laser, this light signal here will replicate the scan of the laser across the absorption line, and then relative to a static sample, we get the velocity. So he measured four kilometers per second. Later, we did this with xenon, and he measured a velocity of 18 kilometers per second. 18 kilometers per second. So this is a really powerful idea. I had another student who, I guess I gotta do this again maybe, oh, there we go. I had another student who was interested in doing this with the molecule of nitric oxide. So this is a little more complicated experiment. We have a, Here's an uh, ex uh, under-expanded jet. That means it's a pressurized system that's coming out of an orifice and it's uh, into a low-pressure chamber. And we wanted to measure the velocity at this point. And there was about half a percent of nitric oxide in nitrogen in this jet. So it's supersonic. We took a special laser, which was monochromatic, which we could be tuning in wavelength. And we bring it in and we pass it through this chamber. And we measured the velocity, we measured the absorption, uh, and we compared this with the static sample. So we measure uh, what we see with the static sample, and we measure the line shape we see with the moving sample, and that's the Doppler. This was some actual data. So he did this, uh, and he varied the angles here. He measure, he's measuring um, the shift was 2.092 gigahertz in frequency unit. He uses specific UV transitions here. And from, and from this, he could get from the, he can get the translational temperature from the width, and he can get the velocity from the shift. And so he, and we did a, we did a simulation of this flow. And we got within three degrees Kelvin. He got, not quite so close on the velocity. He was off by about uh, three parts in 500, uh, three parts in 50, and we get a Mach number. So this is a very powerful tool, but what's new here is we use fluorescence to monitor absorption. But we use the, we use the uh, frequency tuning of the laser to get the, the zone. Now, I had more recently, I had a student who wanted to do this in a full-scale aero engine. We're using a Doppler shift. And so first we did this in the wind tunnel at Stanford. So we have a laser light that comes through and, it, and one of the beam goes upstream and one beam goes downstream. And we use molecular oxygen, which has absorption lines around 760 nanometers. So we got a, a cheap laser, which we could use to tune across these lines of molecular oxygen. And we scan the laser. And so what you should see, one of these beams will see a Doppler shift in one direction, one will see a Doppler shift in the other direction. So if we record those two spectra, we only have to look at the difference between those two peaks. So that's a pretty good idea. 
We also can look at the area under any one of these curves, and from this we can get the, the density of the oxygen that's absorbing, because we know the path length and the temperature. So we can get the density of oxygen, and we can get the velocity from the Doppler shift taken together, that's the mass flux. So this became a way to try to measure the mass flux at the entrance of, an aero, of a full-scale engine. So we took this to, uh, took this to Wright-Patterson, no, we took this to uh, Pratt & Whitney. We took this to Pratt & Whitney and um, into this real full-scale engine. And on the ground, they, uh, they test the engines. And they have a, a, a bell mouth at the entrance. So they try to make the flow come in really uniform. And they're interested in the performance of this engine. So they need to know how much air goes in, how much fuel goes in, how much thrust is produced. The question is, how do they do it? Well, they use a, a pitot rake. They use a pitot tube rake that's parked there. The question is, could we do this with optical techniques? And uh, now this is a big deal. So these uh, students over here in the control room some distance away, uh, is an Airbus 318 engine for that system. And our goal was to measure the velocity and the mass flux as a function of time. So uh, here's a, a versus time in minutes. So the, the Pratt & Whitney people would have individual data points every every minute or two, we would get continuous recording um, here, and we could measure the, both the density and the velocity. So they ramped up the velocity in steps. The question was, how good would you do? We actually got within 1% in V and about 1.5% in density. So our target was about 1%. We didn't quite achieve our target. But the virtue of this is that you conceivably could also do this in flight. Conceivably could do this in flight. Okay. So what I tried to do is show you by the, in these examples that line shapes can be useful. Line shapes can give you properties that can't be measured any other way. So you either need it in order to make proper interpretation of your absorption measurements, or you can use it to learn something about the flow that uh, you can't otherwise get. Absorption is, however, a path, a path integral. All right, so we finished six lectures. Now we're going to go back and we're going to do add in uh, electronic spectra. We'll go back to diatomic molecules and we'll add in, and, and again, it's a lot of semantics. I'm going to introduce you to term symbols and notation and something called Hunt's cases A. So next time we're going to learn about uh, ultraviolet spectra of diatomic molecules. Okay, see you. Mm -hmm.